it's really the best cleanup tool I've found in a while. And it's, you know, easy to use, Amazon. I first saw it at O'Reilly, I'll give them credit. But since Amazon will take it back if you don't like it, I ordered it from Amazon. <laughs> Um, this one, I'm not sure if I showed it last year or not because I had it on my list, but I think I forgot to do it. So this this time I brought my list with me. But um, you know how you use expensive finishes, and uh, there's all kinds of methods to keep it from uh, crusting over on you or whatever you call that. So I got a two by four, and I drilled a hole in it, and I stored it upside down. And so far, I've gone through two cans of it, and I haven't had any problems at all. It seems to work as well as anything I've seen on the market. And it's pretty much free. Um, most of these you've seen somewhere else. I, you know, like everybody, you look at everybody's shop, and on YouTube, you look for things. But um, I use wrenches for my uh, basic measuring, my caliper tools or whatever. But once I got over seven eighths of an inch or something, um, I didn't buy the big set, so I had to do something. So I went from, I think, seven eighths to two inches, and I drilled them out with a Forstner bit, and then I cut them in half. So I have, you can slip it on, or if you just want to size a dial or something, you can use the centerpiece. I don't remember where I saw that, but I didn't make it up. I just saw it somewhere. Um, another one. <coughs> Everybody's got their own idea on how to uh, match your tenons. Um, I'll give Trent Bosch the credit for part of this. Um, he just had his extra jaw, put a magnet on the back, keeps it on his lathe, and then when you're making your tenons, you can perfect, you know, you can size it to see if it fits, and um, works really well as far as your your taper, and um, that that works really well. And then as far as the actual size, <coughs> I've got multiple jaws like most of you do. And I did mine a little different. I, um, I've got one side for the uh, spigot and one side for the recess. And uh, I put the maximum and the minimum that it can be for each of those two on this. So it's got four different dimensions. So if I'm doing a spigot, it's got to be between this and this somewhere. It, it can't. It's not precise, it just has to be there. And most of the time, that's all I'm worried about is make, making sure it'll fit my jaw. Um, and everybody uses rare earth magnets for everything. I, uh, I've, this one, I have rare earth magnets on my remote from my dust collector. And I also always keep them in baggies to keep the dust off of them. Same thing with my television remote. And my <coughs> In my shop, it gets dust too and it keeps them clean. Pretty simple, pretty cheap. If you order anything from um, any, anything in the mail anymore, it comes in baggies, you don't even have to use new ones. And uh, when I was doing my dust collection system, I discovered something. I used Rockler fittings. And on the blast gate, um, I think it's intended for to go inside a four inch pipe. And I, I used four inch pipe on everything. But then I had some three inch laying around and needed to make one more run. And I looked at it and I discovered that the three inch will fit inside if you put a little bit of uh, tape, just to uh, space it. And then I generally put a, a little screw in there, like a lathing screw or something to hold it. And all my joints, when I put it together, I didn't glue any of them. I just tap them up with a hammer. And then I wrap the outside. I put a screw in them if, I, if there's a need and I wrap them with tape. Never have had a problem yet, so uh, quick and easy way, because I change my shop arrangement <laughs> a lot, so I'm always taking it apart, so <laughs> glue doesn't work very well. And I think that's everything for me. Okay. Well, those who know me know I sometimes forget words, and so I wrote everything down, and I'm going to look down a lot at it. Um, Something that uh, uh, I, I started doing, every, the pin makers or anybody's got a little bit of cutoff left, if you will throw those in a pile, which most of us do anyway, 
they make great um, uh, wood uh, refrigerator magnets. And wives, aunts, un you know, aunts, cousins, nieces, whatever, everybody likes those. So you might try that. Um, talking about the magnets, they, I use a, uh, a uh, magnet, uh, what did I say it was? A pan underneath uh, my jaws when I change jaws out. And even if, the, if I drop a screw and it doesn't fall right on top, of the pan, the magnet is strong enough that it'll stick to the side of the pan. And I also have an extendable magnet, so if it by chance misses or gets inside something I can't get to, I can get it out and don't have to bend over. So, um, those of us who, who's been around tennis balls or anything, if you use a tennis ball on your rotating tail stock, you can use that to help uh, pressure, put pressure on uh, a turning. And, it, and if you want to do the bottom of the bowl, you can put that, turn it around, put it on your head stock, and, put, and, and it'll help hold that, that in. Uh, something that I, a problem I had, still have, uh, when I'm making Christmas ornaments, is I'll, I'll start a hole and it's this big, and time I get it hollowed out, it's that big. And, and so then when I make my, my fennel, it's, it's the wrong size. You know, it's either too big or something. And what I found, and I read it somewhere, none of these ideas are mine, is that if you take and turn a little funnel-like thing and uh, wrap some... Uh, Sandpaper around it, you can take and, and put it in your lathe or whatever you want to. I just, I just put a handle on it. And you can just ream a little bit out of that, that hole and make your fennel work. And you're going to cover it up anyway. So if it gets a little ragged, it, it's not important. Um, the, I don't see as well as I used to. So this one hit me. Um, I needed something behind my lathe, behind my piece, so I could see it better, the contour and everything. And I took a piece of, uh, you buy it at any box store, it's a uh, whiteboard. And you can spray the back of that whiteboard with uh, water, and you can curve it and let it dry. And you can set that on the back of your lathe, and you can see the contour of what you're working on really, really well. And I even draw on it with a dry erase marker, so if I give me kind of an idea, so I don't forget where the the different parts are supposed to be. Um, everybody does that. Uh, one thing too, um, the a lot of us have lathes that don't have reverses on them, and we we know that if you can say in both directions you can get your sanding a lot smoother, your wood, your piece a lot smoother. What, what I've done is I, I've got to uh, make up of several at a time, and I just make little coins off a piece of junk wood, um, hard wood. I don't, I've tried uh, pine. It doesn't work very well as well, but hard wood. And uh, uh, most of them, by the way, is a piece of uh, hardboard that, that you buy it by the sheets, and you can just make a little X with them with your uh, saw, and uh, super glue or or yellow glue or hot glue or whatever that is on the end of your your, your uh, turning. And when you get everything done this way and sanded, just take it take it off, turn it around. The hole still fit, and it's still balanced, and you can sand it the other direction. Okay, okay, and some of us might not have the grip we used to have, and so I read this, if you use vice grips on your hollowing tool, you can keep it uh, more stable, and uh, uh, it doesn't twist out of your hand as much, and if, if, if the first time 
you ever let one get away from you and it tears the side out of your piece that you spent an hour and a half, you'll, you'll, you'll wish you'd spent the, the money for vice grips. <laughs> um, we talked a few months ago about um, spalting. And so I, I read different things about what people do to increase the spalting of their wood. And one that kept coming up was Coca-Cola. If you've got uh, wet wood and just cut wood, if you will uh, sprinkle or pour, what they said, pour Coca-Cola, or I guess any cola, over the, the, that wood about once a week, then uh, the sugar feeds the bacteria that you, that you want the microorganisms, whatever they are, I guess they're bacteria. And the uh, acidity of the Coke, or of the soft drink, will help it decay faster. And it, it, that, that works, it works real well. Can you put it in a, like a paper bag or a plastic bag? I, I just have a pile, you know, I stacked my wood up, and I just pour it over the top of them. And just leave it out? I just leave it out. And put a tarp over it so the sun doesn't, doesn't make it crack too bad but I don't have enough room to put some of the... Uh, now, is this a partially turned piece, or is this... No, this is just, a, just raw wood, just right off, right off the tree. And uh, that... Oh, so another thing. I, I, I've got a lot of things, but uh, I'm picking through them. Something that uh, I have a problem with, too, and you folks may... When you clamp something together, when you're doing segmented work, and you clamp it together, and you come back in five minutes, you clamp it down, you go do something else to come back and check it, and it scooched off just a little bit. Has anybody ever had that problem? Yeah. Well, mine scooch off sometimes. And uh, I read that if you take, bring a salt shaker out to the shop, and when you uh, put your glue on both sides like you do, just sprinkle a little salt on one side, clamp it down. The salt doesn't hurt anything, but it keeps it from sliding. And that works too. Um, oh, this one, um, CA glue. And we all have that little knob of CA glue that's dried on the top of a bottle. Everybody does. And you take a shave and you shave it off and it'll come back. If you take a little can, or I've got a little jar, of petroleum jelly, and when you open that can up, or that CA bottle up, and take the top off of it, just take some of that, uh, petroleum jelly and put around the nozzle of that and then when every time you put the, the cat back on it it lubes it a little and but you, you don't have that clump at the end of your bottle and something that uh, uh, yeah because I'm, I'm going to quit pretty re real quick here uh, we all have dead blow hammers and those of us who don't wish we did. And a very inexpensive dead blow hammer is go down to Harbor Freight or wherever you want to do and get a regular claw hammer and put a, a end off of a cane or something on the top of that and that you, you can tap something in there and it doesn't ever hurt your wood and you give it a pretty good blow and uh, it, it helps it helps that way. Wooden plugs. Have any of you ever tried to take anything apart to use the wood that has screws and wood plugs in them? And if you dig on the wood plugs, you'll damage the wood. This I found out by mistake. Uh, the only thing I, I can say that I did that, uh, um, that I didn't read about, and that's this. If you take a, a screw and you screw down in the center of that plug, that's, that screw will split the plug and the, the threads on that screw will back that thing out. And if, if you got, most of it's put in with uh, Phillips head screwdriver, or Phillips head screws, it'll hit the center of that screw and it'll stay put, it won't wander off. And it'll back those plugs out and you can really zip through uh, taking the plugs out. And one thing, in the, and then I'm gonna quit. Uh, those of us who have problems with uh, ambient dust when you're when you're finishing something, 
if you go to, uh, and I don't want to plug anybody, but if you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, they have little food tents, and I think, you, I think they're $7. You get two of them for $7 or maybe $8, and they're not very big. But you can, well, about that big, I guess. But you can take those and, and put your finish on something and set it over on your table and, and all that. Put one of those little tents on it, and then you go on about your turn, turning or whatever you want to do, and that dust will not get on your freshly uh, what a finished work. So. Well. I drill them on the lathe. I chuck this up in a chuck, and I put a, a drill chuck um, in the tailstock, and I, I crank it in and, and, and drill them. And I bought some long drills so I can drill five or six inches deep. Um, I built, I made a scoochie gouge for the bring backs tonight. I only drilled this, I think, about three or four inches because it's, I'm using a, a relatively short piece of steel in it. So um, you drill it to the appropriate length that, for the tool you want to make. So. Uh, the aluminum is 6061 T6 aluminum. Yes, it is. And uh, so it's, it's fairly hard, yet it's soft enough to turn if you want to uh, tailor the edge of it a little bit. Uh, it, it can turn it very easily with, a, with a, just a scraper. So it, it turns really well. Any questions on that? I buy set screws from the local guy at Denton Bolt, and I use quarter 20 set screws, and they're just a quarter inch long. And uh, you use a number seven drill for a quarter 20 uh, tap. Any other questions? Um, <laughs> this fits really tight. Um, the guys that went to Trent Bosch's class in uh, Colorado found out that he uses a, he's got a jig where he blows air into it and it expands it just enough so it slides on his handles. I've not tried that. What I do is I cut it to length or maybe a little bit long and I put it into a jig and I just beat it on with a hammer. <laughs> uh, the, the first time I made one of these, instead of using aluminum, I used steel. And so I said, to put this on, it's gonna, it'll be real easy. I'll just soak it in some water and put a little soap on it. Well, you can't get the water out of inside here when you put it on. So the handle is all rusted now inside, <laughs> inside the, uh, the tubing. So, and it makes for a pretty heavy tool. So I've gone to the aluminum and I like that a lot better and then I don't use water. I just beat it on with a, with a rubber mallet. Ed. I don't have any trouble just beating it on. It, it goes, <laughs> you know, it goes on pretty easy and I, and I don't want some residue down in here to, to, to make it look, you know, like it's got, I put something on it, so that's why I just beat it on. Is it on? Okay. Um, I did almost the same thing, except um, I used a hollow tube, and then I used uh, this, I think this is three quarter inch and maybe half inch inside, and I used a solid half inch and just made a plug about this long. I glued in the end, and I glued a plug here, but I only drilled, I only had to drill about this much, but the tool could be a lot longer and fit clear in. Or if you wanted to, you could load it with shot then. So that's an alternate way of doing it. You don't have to drill as deep. And it's probably easier to drill. It's very easy to drill because I was right up at the headstock drilling rather than sticking out here a long ways. Okay. My wife is into um, working with glass and fusing glass and that sort of thing. And for Christmas last year, I bought her a, a right angle grinder so that she could grind and polish edges of her glass. And uh, and she went out and bought all these diamond discs to fit on this grinder. And, and uh, when she bought the diamond discs, it came with a bunch of these uh, heads that uh, Velcro to the, to the, 
the uh, disc that she uses, and this just screws onto her, onto her grinder. And she ended up with a couple of them, so she gave me one. And it's got this weird thread on the back, which is 5 eighths by 11. And so I said, hey, you know, how can I get that onto the lathe? So I built a jig to screw onto the lathe. And I put this disc grinder, or this grinder head on. And it's, since it's Velcro, you can easily just put sanding discs on here. And now you've got a, 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 a way of, of doing sanding that's really inexpensive and, and works really well. And uh, you can use, put a coarse piece of sandpaper on here when you're making a tool or something and it, you don't have to worry about having a grinder that, like Sam uses a, a Tormac and it'd take him a couple of months to grind down a, a piece of steel. <laughs> With this you could put a 46 grit piece of paper on here as long as it's got Velcro on it and, and you could grind your tools, you can you can, after you take a piece of wood off the lathe, if you want to, you, you got a nub on, from the end of it, you could, you could spin it up and you could take that off. So it's really kind of a neat, unique idea. If you make one for a Jet Mini, you've got to use a Allen head screw because the Jet Mini hull is so small that it barely fits in there. So you, you can't use a hex head screw like I used the first time for an inch and a quarter eight. Uh, I'm going to leave this on here for a minute. So after I got this jig made, I said, you know, what else can you do with it? <laughs> well, um, you can go on Amazon and you can buy these buffing wheels that you buy for a right angle grinder for polishing your car and that sort of thing. And that has the same thread. So now you've got a buffer as well. And it comes with three different pads. So you could put three different compounds on it. It's really expensive. This is 12 bucks for the, for the, uh, the base plate and the three pads. And if worse comes to worse, you take this off. And you can put a piece of sandpaper on here. Now you've got a big grinder. So Sam, if you want to grind your tools some more. <laughs> so it, it works really well. Um, I've used it at um, putting carnauba wax on here and spinning this up. And it really works nice. And it's nice and soft. It, you can't get inside a bowl with it. But you can certainly do an outside of a bowl, or you can do a, um, if you're making a handle, I notice you've got a handle, you could certainly put a handle on here and, and buff it up when you're done, so. Uh, this came with the grinding head that my wife, or the pads that my wife bought. But if you go on eBay, all the grinders use this, this 5 8 11 thread. You get the bolt. I just went to Denton Bolt and, and asked them for it, and you can get it in any length you want. It's a standard bolt. I, I didn't realize it was, but it, you know, it's just a standard bolt. And I'll pass this around. Any other questions? I'm done. Good. I'm John Beasley. Yep, Beasley. In case you... <laughs> In case you didn't listen to David Honig, uh, my first one is <laughs> keep it from skimming over. So I'm going to be real quick tonight. Uh, my second one is very, very simple. Uh, in setting the depth uh, on the rod on your uh, sharpening equipment, uh, on your grinder, a lot of times you'll put it in there. You move it back and forth and get the bevel on the wheel and go ahead and grind it. And I did that for a long time. And what happens is it drifts after a while. It, what starts out at 60 degrees goes one way or the other. And then if you're, uh, all of your tools become different. So what I did is made these, uh, just a little spacer or a gauge. 
And so when you bring in, this would be, I use a Wolverine. When you bring in that bottom, uh, this is on the back of it and that's on the face. And I've got it marked that this is for the 60 degree. And I also mark on the uh, holder which notch it's in, in case I change it in the future. So that uh, I'm always coming up with the same angle. This will really reduce your wear because you're over, essentially you're over grinding because you're trying to find it and bring it back. And then I have one for the bottom feeders and one for the detail. And it takes a, a minute or two to do it and it just saves a lot of time and wear and tear on your, on your drills. Not enough. Uh, Especially if you use like the, the jig for the, uh, the gouges. Yeah. Well, well, I have the uh, I have I have the hard wheel, so it's not gonna get get further away. If you have just a, the standard stone, each time you dress it, you're making your wheel smaller, and you're correct. It would do it in that case. Uh, I'm going to talk about sandpaper. And uh, my experience has always been, uh, until I took a little time, is that I could never find what I wanted. So I'm working on a project, and I'm going in there. And I've got a stack of paper, and I go through it. And oh, by the way, I've just worked up to 220, and I don't have any. So I go get the paper, cut it up, start again. And it's just annoying. So I decided few years ago to uh, get organized and uh, I usually cut them I think about everyone cuts them in squares and a, a good way to cut it is an old carving <laughs> old kitchen knife just works great because it's good and long and just fold it cut them and uh, and this is uh, this is not a demonstration and uh, tip on how to cut paper obviously but <laughs> that's one to make a point so uh, what I've done is I uh, designed and built and I encourage you to do the same a little sandpaper uh, organizer and it's it's very simple and it's set up for your standard paper cut in four quarters and it goes in the wide side goes in like so, and it's got enough of a lip on each one of them so you can get purchase on that without dragging them all out. And the way it's made is very simple. This is a 1 8 inch uh, Baltic birch ply, and I happen to use on this one a uh, Baltic birch half inch for the spacers, and they're in this case, they're cut to half by half. They could be anything you want. And, uh, and the way you do it is real, real simply is start with the top piece and make it uh, about 3 quarters of an inch. In this case, they're all 3 quarters of an inch smaller than your paper, a little bit. And then, your, then each of your shelves is three quarters of an inch smaller than the prior. And just move it down and make as many as the, the grits you want to organize and store in here. And then, uh, then cut your spacers and stops in here. There's a, there are stops in here, not on the top one, but on each of these coming across going down so that the paper doesn't disappear forever. See? That's all there is to it. And the, bit, the longest time is gluing it up. And you start at the bottom, put your sides uh, and, your, uh, and your stop in the back. Then you have to wait for it to dry, put the next one on, yada, yada. So that, that takes most of the time uh, putting it together. But, and also having these little steps 
I have them marked here with each of the grits. So it's very handy when you're, when you're starting to turn. You can just glance at it, see what you have, and you know where to pull it out. And taking inventory is when you're down to the last one, go ahead and fill it up. And so you're not stopping in the middle of a job, which for me is just very frustrating. Oh, rats, here we go, you know, forgot that. Um, so for, uh, for tonight, I made, uh, I made three, of you, three of these, which uh, I have a bring back. That's the bring back. These are two extras. So I would encourage you to buy a whole bunch of tickets and have three shots of getting organized. And it's a lot easier than cut, cutting up all these pieces and gluing them together. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mike. Uh, Teddy already got one of my ideas, but I'm going to go ahead and demo it. Um, I make up a lot of blanks for, you know, putting my uh, headstock on, doing whatever I need to do, and just using a lot of scraps. One of my biggest frustrations was that every time I would glue this up, walk away, come back, the two pieces would slide just a little bit. So now my my circle was a little smaller than I ever wanted. So to solve that, I saw this a while back and did the same thing. Oh, what if I got glue inside my bag? I'd put my glue on smear it all around, get it spread, well it's not too bad, like so, and like Teddy was saying, I'd keep a little salt out in the, the shop, and I usually hit the outside edges because that's the part that gets turned off, but it creates such a, yeah, it creates a, an abrasive thing that once you squeeze it together, it does not want to go, I'm trying to slide it right now and it just feels like it's sandpaper between the two and so it makes it very easy to now take your clamp and they stay right there they don't slide kind of a fun little deal as some of you know I'm trying to learn all about segmented wood turning and one of my biggest issues has been, and I'm sure you guys probably experienced this a lot, you can never have too many clamps, right? So before I got these really nice, uh, they're not automotive clamps, they're adjustable, but they look like an automotive hose clamp. They're about 10 inches round. Before I got that, I was taking my little two pieces and I'd glue two pieces, two pieces, two pieces with just regular clamps. And uh, then one day I was like, ah, oh, I need to glue something else up. I'd used all my clamps. And I was just so frustrated. So sitting there with my frustration, I was like, what am I going to do now? Got nothing to do. So I uh, had my piece like so. Spread it all around. Make sure it's oozing out so that it leaves a mark in my bag. I went, grabbed a couple more pieces of scrap, just made a little C, C, C clamp like so, put that in the middle, take a wedge, slide that in, L perfect. And it, it, it really is, it just makes such a difference. And you can use a little mallet if you want, but uh, you really almost don't even need to do that. As you can see, some of the glue squeezing out. So, pretty simple little idea. I don't know if you guys want to see it or. You are more than welcome. The one thing that I got out of this club is uh, 
you can never have too many gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so much easier and so much cheaper to make your own. And I was just going to encourage uh, everyone to always look at trying to make your own. The other day I was kind of working on a bowl and I needed a depth gauge because I thought I was maybe going to go through the bottom. <laughs> so I think in less than an hour and for you know, a couple of pieces of scrap that were literally in my burn pile, made a depth gauge that, w that works just fine. I can, I can take this and I can adjust it to whatever I need. You know, and then as I, I put that in there and go, I can tell exactly where I'm at. So I would encourage everyone else to also just make, make your own little uh, gadgets and gizmos, and next year we can have that many more. That's a trick that John Solberg, when I first got here, showed me. So basically, just a piece of wood. Can you see it? There. It's just a piece of wood. Drilled the hole through it that was the same diameter as the, the screw. Put a little epoxy in it. He did his a little fancier than mine, but I was working with a very thin piece of wood. I don't know if you can see that or not. Towards me. It's just a screw. Screw or bolt? Or, well, I guess it's a bolt. Thank you. And then what I did here is... Uh, I, I drilled my hole this way, and then I drilled the hole this way. I uh, then screwed this in. Then I take some uh, uh, CA glue, the really thin glue, dropped it in there, and let that dry. And then once you put that in, it, it threads it, and it pretty much keeps those threads pretty good for a while. So that's just a simple little, literally... Only took a, a very short time to put together. And that's mine. You know, preparation in, in a project is, is, is key. And so I got to the point, many of you see my shop, I've got a whole bunch of bowl blanks already, already uh, cut out and ready to go. And so before I started, I went and got some eighth inch plywood and made a series of circles of various diameters that I could use. There's a center point on there so I can, can put it in there and then take to the bandsaw, make a nice clean cut around there, coat the blank, stick it on the shelf, you know, ready to turn as, as, as I go forward. Uh, this was uh, some scrap from another project that I had. Uh, they're just labeled and I put a nice hole in there so that they'll just sit on the wall on a peg and I can grab them as, as I need them. Most of you know that I'm pretty frugal. My wife says I'm cheap. Uh, I, uh, sanding is, is, is one of my least favorite things to do. But uh, I spotted this someplace, and I can't remember where it was. Uh, but it's a bow sander. That uh, It's just a, a piece of two by four that, that I've cut into an arc. Uh, and most of these... I put a bandsaw kerf where I can turn around and, and take my sandpaper of whatever grit that I want, stick it in there and pull it around. Uh, I found that it's easier to, to use the kerf on one end and then just a staple on the other. And then as you're getting ready to sand your bowl or your turned object, you know, you've got various grits that you've got a nice wide area uh, because there's nothing on the back side. Uh, you don't get a lot of heat buildup, uh, and it's very quick to, uh, to, to go through and sand. As you want to go next to an edge, you, you, know, you can hold to the edge of it here and, and, and cut in on a, on a nice uh, crisp edge uh, as you want to sand. And again, I use, I use they're cheap. You, you can use various sandpapers, and again, uh, you go through your grits very quickly uh, as you're turning the outside of, of a turned object. One of the least maintenance item uh, and one of the most critical on keeping your lathe clean and tuned up is the inside of the Morris taper. If they get dusty, if they get rusty, if they get dirty, they won't hold the grip. 
and uh, you can't use uh, WD-40, you know, because all that's going to do is, is, is going to allow it to have some lubricant in there and they'll slip. So what I've done is, is, is I use a 20 gauge shotgun, 12 gauge shotgun, uh, it's a wire brush, you know, for, for cleaning your shotgun. And it, it's just the right size to fit in there to keep it nice and clean. Uh, because it's copper, it won't scratch the metal, uh, but, but it'll knock that dust and, and build up out of there very, very quickly. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's very inexpensive to use. That's a 12 gauge. Much like, uh, you know, I'm not into tools like John, but uh, there was a time that I was, uh, was turning some small flowers uh, to go on the bottom of a bowl, and it required a really small uh, turning, and, and so I took an ice pick, and, and you go through and, and you, you grind the end, uh, you put the, 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 the bevel on the bottom, and it's amazing that, that the control that you have in turning something very small, uh, it doesn't, you know, doesn't take up a lot of room. So, you know, you can, you can get some really nice detail work. And uh, ice picks are, are, are pretty tough piece of metal. Uh, and and they, they hold an edge pretty good uh, for really small stuff. I don't recommend it on any of the stuff that Jim does because it'd probably catch it and throw it across the room. <laughs> It loose. Now, if you really want to get bold uh, and get out on the edge and experience the dangers of life, uh, coating the outside of, of, of wood as you, as you prep it, getting ready to make a bunch of bowl blanks. Uh, when your wife is not home, you uh, just slip quickly into the kitchen and you grab her favorite skillet. And, and then find your old hot plate uh, that uh, you never had a use for. And then I have found soy wax for making candles. Uh, it, it's cheap. Uh, two pounds was like uh, $3. It's a low temperature melting wax, melts at about 180 degrees. Uh, you know, when it dries, it stays there, but when, when you heat it up, it's clear. And uh, what I do is I've got a dedicated brush that I use, and, and you can take your piece, you can heat the, heat the wax up, and you can coat it very quickly. Uh, it, it leaves a nice surface on, on the, uh, the piece that you're turning. Uh, and then uh, it dries pretty quickly. Uh, and then you stack it up on the shelf and, and, and wait until you've got time to do it. The hardest part is, is getting the skillet when she's not in the house <laughs> and not letting her come out to the garage to see what you're doing. <laughs> so uh, easy, to, easy to do uh, and, and very effective. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the stuff skimming over because when you turn it off, well, that's just the base stock for the next time you heat it up. Uh, so there's no waste. So yeah, but chewy. <laughs> so that's all I've got. Um, well, I've got a, for those that, some of you know, I turn large large things. I turn large uh, hollow forms. And I'm always looking at a way to, uh, um, to maximize. I've got a 25 inch swing on my robust. I've got an American Beauty with a 25 inch swing. And I try, to, I try to blank out with the chainsaw as large as I can because by the time I round it out and then I, I, I boil it and I end up shrinking it, it shrinks back and I second turn it, I lose a couple inches and for some reason I think I have to have them you know, the maximum I can just because I, I can. And so th this here is a, is a piece of, uh, I, I went up to uh, this last week uh, to uh, uh, St. Cloud, my hometown, St. Cloud, Minnesota, 
cut down a gigantic burled uh, box elder tree. It was, uh, this is one of the pieces from it. Go on okay. to the next picture. You know, it's, it's easy to, to round something out when you, got, when you put it on a, uh, on a uh, bandsaw and get it perfectly round. The thing I was having a frustration with is on an irregular surface like you see here, how do I get a perpendicular, with the chainsaw, a perpendicular cut to, to what will be a face that's going to either go on my headstock or tailstock? And then even more difficult for me was how do I find opposite of center? So what I did was I, I came up with a drawing. Of a, of a laser that can help me chainsaw this particular surface. And after I came up with this drawing, it looked exactly like what I already had bought from Steve Sinner for my Halloween bar. And this piece was sitting in my garage the entire time I'm imagining this magical thing that will work for me. And simply, you go on to the next shot. Uh, um, actually, that's just a, and I, 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 I kind of mark out the pieces as this is probably a thousand pound chunk that's going to be made into one piece. Go on to the next one, and I, you see it, you see the device right now, I've simply, I've simply screwed this, I simply screwed this down, and, it, and it, just, it just swings around, it swings a perfect arc. I have a, on here, I have a, a mark for the maximum, I have it at 24 and a half inch for, the, for my lathe, so that's the maximum size I can get on my lathe comfortably, and I can tell you, um, go, go, go on to the next one. You can see the laser here, and it's really hard to mark a top of an irregular shaped log. I don't care if it's Sharpie, I don't care what you got. It's not going to accurately, and this, the, the best thing about this is it, is it shows me where plumb is. Plumb being perpendicular to a, a surface. You got to pick a surface on this big round irregular shape and make what's, so you don't have all these facets. Go on to the next shot. Um, Here's how I do that. While I'm making my cut, see, I've, I've drawn a dotted line on top of the log or down the edge of the log if I can, but I really don't need that. I don't have to draw any lines on it at all. The laser tells me wh where to cut. I, you can see the laser, the light is on the bottom of the chainsaw right there, and the, it's on the top of the chainsaw. My chainsaw is running perpendicular to where I want to go. Go on to the next one, and, 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 uh, and away you go. You can see the laser dots down halfway. You see it very well. Yeah. Walk over there. See the laser dot right here? It's way down on the log, and, uh, and that's, that's the part I, a lot of your, your figure is, is closest to your, uh, to your, to your barked edges. So I try, to get, I try to get as close to the bark as I can on the top and on the sides. So I really want a lot of these, and I make inclusions on mine. I also have a lot of negative space designed into them, and this tool really helps me imagine that space down on a log, down on the side of the log, instead of up on a surface. I don't know how applicable it's going to be for some of you guys that do the small, smaller stuff, and you can bandsaw. That's really nice to do if you've got a flat on top and bottom, but I, I, I don't. Go on to the next one. And then you can really see, you can see here, the laser is hitting two spots on that log. It's hitting there, it's hitting down there, and I'm working my way around the log. I still have some facets here I'm working off. Go, around, go on to the next one. Um, I don't know why that's, there. oh yeah, there's another dot down here on this. You see the burl here? I don't want to. I, I want to include that. I want to make sure it's on there. So I, I you know, I, I'm kind of sizing this up as I go. Go on to the next. I think I'm just about done here. Um, here you can see how it how it works on a. There's a beveled cut on a piece. How it works off the bevel. You can see the. I guess the laser. Yeah, the laser's down on the edge of the log there. When I, and it just tells me I need to cut a little bit more there until this laser drops off. Until it drops all the way off the end. Now I, then I I know I'm not proud. I know it's going to fit on my lathe without hitting. So. Next, there's a, uh, this is a rounded out, I think this is, yeah, completely done. This is about as round as you're gonna get without band sawing a 400, 400 pound piece of wood. And, and I can tell you it goes on beautifully. And, and, and at this point, I'll show you, what, this is the thing. Now to find center, I just took a half inch threaded rod and actually, because it's, it's looser than the inside diameter of this, now of course I didn't make any of this, this, is, this comes from Steve Sinner. It's got a little laser, turns on, I haven't turned it on. Turns on right here, you see it? Uh, and, uh, but then to find center, now that I've gone through this, uh, I've, I've made a really accurately round thing, I, use, I put this in and I just tap it, tap it to find center. That gives me my center point, okay? Bang, just bang, that's center. Now to find opposite of center, go on to the next one. Um, I lay the, I lay the uh, log on its side, and where the laser drops off, you can see the laser right on the edge here. 
And actually where it just drops off at, I can actually just take my tape measure and I can me measure from the point of that to, in my case, 12 and a quarter inches because I'm going for a, a, a 24 and a half inch uh, uh, total diameter. But I can, you can see I've marked opposite of center right here, and that gives me a dead on, because for me, it, it doesn't matter if I can do a perfect round, if I can't get centers and opposite of centers from each other, it's gonna go on, a, and, a, and, a, and a 400 pound log is, is hard to wrestle around and jack with. Once you get it between centers, I don't wanna have to chainsaw, so I don't wanna have to do anything, but this is a good way to, to maximize, or even if you're trying, trying to maximize the swing on your lathe, but to give you a perpendicular cut, to a, to a plane. So that's that. I think I turned this off. Any questions? How did I get it home is the question. Well, I have a, I bought a, I, I have a, a tree, uh, a tree dolly that moves 1,000, 1,500 pound chunks. I got it, I got it all up on a, uh, pulled a 16 foot trailer. I got it all up on there and then I spent three days chainsawing it into lathe ready rounds. So. So I just, I had my chuck on, I just had a piece of three quarter inch wood that was in the chuck. And then I made it smooth and then cut the jam chuck. So I finished my work, now I can't get the bowl off the jam chuck. So I tried to pry and didn't want to hurt anything and bumping at it. Finally I, I decided to drill a hole, I took it out of the, the chuck, drill just a quarter inch hole and took my air a hose, just held it on there, and I picked up the bowl from the other corner of the room, <laughs> but it popped right off there. So I, the, the, I think the key to this is to remember to always have a hole in that jam chuck so that you can get in. At first I was going to try and push it off with a rod, but I didn't want to wreck the bottom of the, so I don't know if anybody's tried the air, but it works real well. Thanks. All right. When you're making hollow forms, or things you want to drill in to get the depth. Uh, you can use a uh, just a regular drill, but then you have to drill in a little bit, pull it out, clean it out. So you can also use a gun drill. You can buy a gun drill from, um, oh, I don't know, Amazon or somewhere for $20 or less. And uh, you need to put something on here to put air through it. So what you do is uh, there's a hole kind of through the center here that normally with metal it pumps oil through. So what you do is you just hook air to it. So what I did, I took a piece of aluminum, drilled out, there's this, uh, there's a, it's expanded a little bit here. And I drilled it out, epoxied it in, put threads on the end, and then put a valve on here. And then I've got a valve, I can turn on and off. And when I want to drill, I just push it in and it just goes right in. You don't have to pull it out until you get clear to the bottom. So it's very fast for drilling. That's it. <laughs>